All right, peace be upon you, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Now, in today's video, I just want to read another portion of my book, which is a rebuttal of every objection against the Quran, the Christian and biblical worldview refuted in favor of Quran alone Islam. And in this section of the book specifically, I'm going to be going over the the summary reasons for why I not I think I know that the Quran is it is objectively speaking a superior scripture to the Bible. There's no way about it, and I'm just going to go through the reasons. So, and I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory as well. So, this backstory I talk about in another part of the book. How at one point I did want to be a Christian in my life, and there's a few reasons for that. Mainly because I, when I was younger, around 14, 15, 16, 17, I surrounded myself with a lot of these conservative, anti-New World Order, even sometimes Christians who believe in the true shape of the earth. And the people who I saw doing the most work in that cause, really fighting against evil, fighting against the forces of Satan, are Christians. It's sad to say that the Hadith and religion that I grew up in, the mosques that I've been around, uh, they're very compromised. They're very interested in comfort. They don't understand the spiritual warfare as much as many of the Christians do. And this inspired me to be a Christian at one point in my life, but I could not. And the reasons I'm going to share with you now are the reasons why I was never able to become a Christian. And I could not betray the Quran because I knew it was definitely a faithful scripture. So in this book right here, I, I go, go through many things. I deal with every single one of the alleged contradictions on answering Islam's website that they supposedly found in the Quran. I list them all off and then I refute them line by line. I And then I, in the second part of the book, I start to put my own arguments against the Bible and the Christianity in general, why I believe Quran alone Islam is a more viable position. So we'll start the reading right now. Why can we trust the Quran? A summary. Why the Qur'an is objectively superior to the Bible, point by point. So, every single point I'm going to share with you here, they're all expanded upon in more detail in other sections of the book, but this is kind of like a wrapping up, a summary, as it says. So, to wrap up this work, I will leave you with a summary of the reasons why I have found the Qur'an to be more convincing as a scripture, arguments which may be of interest to you. Now, before I delve deeper into this matter, allow me to just preface as a preliminary that I do certainly understand that there are many other styles of arguments other individuals have put forward to strengthen the case that the Quran is, a divine, the Quran is divinely inspired, such as mathematical proofs like the fact that the word day in the singular appears 365 times within the text and the word month in the singular occurs 12 times. Some of these mathematical proofs can get rather elaborate, things which either mathematicians have had to figure out or sophisticated computer softwares by running the Qur'an through them. I openly accept that people from, and let me quickly stop here, so um, I accept that there are other styles of arguments people have put forward, but uh, the, the way I would argue for the scripture, or a scripture being the word of God, and the, the points that I find most convincing are not ones where you would require running the Quran, or that would require running the Quran, or running the Bible, or running some book through a massive mathematical calculator that only existed in the modern world to find out all these, you know, how many times words appeared. I accept that the Quran does have, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a 19er, I'm not a 19er, I repudiate that doctrine. Uh, as Brother Igor says, I think that they've done a lot of harm to the Quran alone movement. I'm not a 19er, but I do accept the premise that there is a geometrical and mathematical divine layout to the Quran, but I don't think those are the most convincing reasons why it's the Word of God. It can't be. It has to be something more easy, more accessible, something within the message of the Quran itself that can convince you it's sacred scripture, that you wouldn't need like a mathematical degree or these supercomputers to figure out. So continuing with the reading. I openly accept that people from various disciplines and walks of life bring their own talents to the Quran and embrace their findings as more than likely valid even if I may not fully comprehend all of them due to my own algebraic shortcomings. But, despite my acknowledgement of the Qur'an being, among many other things, a mathematical marvel unlike any other, definitely it is within the Creator's capability to structure it in such a way, and perhaps even expected that he would, even still, my own style of apologetics inclines more towards other kinds of evidence. 
rather than diving headlong into a sea of complex mathematical equations and calculations, I instead prefer to focus on the more on the core message and qualities of the scripture in question and deduce therefrom whether the said claimed scripture is truly from God or not. So those are the kinds of proofs I'm looking for because I the uh, I, I want to get to the heart of the text, the main message itself. There has, like I said, there has to be something about the way it communicates, the message it's communicating, the consistency with it that convinces you it's the word of God. Again, not by running it through some supercomputer and finding all kinds of mathematical miracles, but it's just got to be obvious from reading it. Um, the Quran, yeah, we can do that, but the main purpose of the Quran is not to run it through a mathematical computer. It's to read it right, and follow it as guidance. The fact remains that not all of us are mathematicians. Not all of us possess supercomputers or the knowledge to use such computers at our disposal that we can plug the Quran into to see what kind of numbers it churns out. Nor has this level of technology existed in every period in geography and human history for people to use it. If a book truly be a revelation for all of mankind, there must exist some way of powerfully demonstrating its veracity which is not reliant on highly specialized knowledge or tools. There has to be something about this divine writ's foundational teachings which allows it to stand distinct from every, every other book in the world. The greatest proof that the Quran is inspired cannot only have been found in the 21st century during the technological age with supercomputers and elaborate algorithms. The strongest arguments for the legitimacy of the Quran are present within the words of the text itself, accessible to anybody in any era who has the opportunity to read it. It is proofs of this nature, relate, relating to the teaching, paradigm, and style of the Qur'an, which I will primarily be focusing on here, to put forward the case that it is indeed a sacred, divinely inspired writ. Simply put, these points are the ones that made me, and keep me, a devout believer in this truly special word called the Qur'an. So now we will go through point by point why the Qur'an, again, is objectively speaking superior to the Bible. It is a faithful continuation of the Abrahamic tradition. It is not some later on interpolation or invention like the Book of Mormon, but it is a faithful successor, successor inspired by the same God of Abraham. So, number one reason why the Qur'an is superior to the Bible. It is one book with one consistent message from cover to cover. The Qur'an is not like the Bible, which is the product of the, of the hands of dozens of authors from dozens of time periods that give us contradictory testimonies regarding important issues, and varies in quality depending on which part you read. The Qur'anic text is cut from the same cloth from the beginning to the end, it does, and does not leave one confused after reading it in its entirety. So that's one of the main points. If you look at the Bible, it is, again, objectively speaking, a very confusing read. And the reason is because it's not one book. The Quran, uh, sorry, the Bible is a library, biblio library. It's a library of multiple books from multiple time periods and multiple conditions in multiple languages. And all of these books have in common that they believe or espouse this God Yahweh, this God of the children of Israel. But you get competing theologies, competing salvational plans, competing messages. Um. It's had so many hands on it throughout the history. It's it's a difficult read. When, when you go through the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation, the thought any reader naturally has is, okay, what was the point of all that? You don't know. It doesn't really have a main focus, and it contradicts itself so many times. So when you, you have the Old Testament, then you get into the New Testament, which is, you know, relatively... For the most part, oh, not even the New Testament, I'm saying the Gospels, the three first Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're relatively in line with the Old Testament, fine. Then you get into John, which is crazy. It's just like this Gnostic, Neoplatonic, Hellenized Gospel. You know, it, it presents the most ethereal view of Christ. Very clearly, that they're trying to show him as this like quasi-God-man, this emanation of the divine in our lower world, and that's kind of odd. It contradicts everything else we read in the Bible before. And then finally, we get into Paul, who has another agenda entirely. Um, nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with the works, but his faith alone salvation. So the Bible will leave you confused and it's not like the Quran. The Quran is obviously cut from the same cloth. It has the same message from the beginning to the end. It's um, When you read that thing cover to cover, if you read that Quran cover to cover, you will know exactly who you are, what your purpose is, where you're going, and what you need to do to please your maker. And 
this is one of the primary reasons why I could not accept the Bible as a superior scripture. It just has too much testimony, too much conflicting testimony. And for anybody who doesn't believe me, who doesn't have a biblical background, I encourage you, read the Qur'an cover to cover, or even biblical background people who don't have a background with the Qur'an. Read the other book cover to cover. Read the Qur'an cover to cover. Read the Bible cover to cover, and undoubtedly you will see which book is more clear in its testimony. Undoubtedly. And... Yeah, you'll probably find contradictions in both. And remember, it's not contradictions in the Qur'an. Many times you'll find contradictions in these bad translations of the Qur'an, these bad commentaries, maybe your own presuppositions. But you'll be confused either way because no translation is perfect. But overall, you know, you'll find little things that are confusing. But overall, which has given you a more consistent message, which has left you more confused, and which has left you less confused? Undoubtedly, the Qur'an is, will leave you less confused, and the Bible will leave you more confused. So that's my first reason. It is one book with one message from the cover to cover. Number two, the Qur'an does not carry all of the racial and historical baggage that the Bible does. Most of the Bible... Okay, let me quickly expound on this right now. So if you read the Bible, it is cluttered with so many place names and people names and histories and petty historical skirmishes. There's so much excess junk in there, which um, it may have meant something to some. Like, you know, they'll have these long lists of genealogies. And I even think Paul, he says something about don't hinder yourself, don't burden yourself with these endless lists of genealogies. It's all throughout the Bible. Son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, running chapter after chapter, place after place. And here's the thing. These places and names may have meant something to somebody long ago in a very different culture. Um, a child of Israel, living in the ancient world, living in that area. He may have heard of these names and heard of these people and heard of these areas, but People like us in the 21st century, a Pakistani in Canada in the 21st century, you guys, you know, even even a Jew in the 21st century, um, it doesn't have any relevance to us. And um, I'm not making, I'm not virtue signaling. I'm not making an argument of oh, it's bad for it to have all this historical baggage. I'm not coming at it from that perspective. My argument is a little more subtle and profound than that. I, I'm saying that um. It's just not relevant to us. It's not relevant. Um, the, the Bible, at least the Old Testament, is mainly concerned with this covenant God has with this group called the children of Israel. And it leaves out of the account a large portion of mankind. The Quran does not have that. The Quran, um, in history is important, of course. The Quran does tell us history. God narrates to us reports of the past. But the difference is the, the Quran, whenever it does narrate to us these reports, it's with some kind of philosophical or moral lesson behind it. It's not meaningless history, right? The Bible reads like any other epic you would read, like the Iliad, which is the epic of the Greeks and Romans, or, I don't know, uh, the epic of Gilgamesh, which is the epic of Mesopotamia, or the Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, which is the epic of the Indian subcontinent. It reads like an epic of the children of Israel. It's confined and locked to its history. Um, it, it has all of this stuff which hinders the reading and is, is not accessible to people like you and I. The Quran, especially if you have a faithful translation of it, it doesn't have all of this historical and racial baggage within it. It is, as it claims to be, a message for all of mankind, a revelation for all of mankind. And... Um, in order again, it's not a virtue signaling argument. I'm just saying, in order for um, I have to be honest about who I am. I, as far as I know, and I know Brother Igor is talking about the children of Israel maybe a lot larger than we think we knew them as. Okay, whatever. But um, at least the presentation the Bible gives of you know that they're, they're this small group in the Middle East. I am not that small group in the Middle East. I don't live in ancient Israel. I. That's not my perspective. So this covenant and this message, which doesn't have much to do with me, a, a man whose ancestors are from the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, being born and raised in Canada, like I'm going to follow a message which is relevant to me, which is um, pertinent to me. And the Quran claims to be for all of mankind, and I see it as absolutely that. It's not an Arab superiority book. It's not a, a message only for the Arabs. It claims to be for all of mankind, and that's what I see. It's it, If you grab a faithful translation, it's easily accessible, but you don't have that with the Bible. And 
naturally, it makes sense for us to follow something which is pertinent and relevant to us. So I'll continue with the reading. Most of the Bible seems to only care about the covenant God has with this small group called the children of Israel concerning the small place in the Middle East called the land of Canaan and the histories associated therewith. What relevancy does such a narrative have with the bulk of mankind who have no connection with that lineage or geography? So think of somebody like you, think of somebody like my wife, half Nigerian, half Italian, born in Canada. What, what, what does this have to do with her in any way? It's just, again... I'm not saying, oh, it's racist, therefore it's bad. I'm, I'm saying that it's it's not for us. It doesn't read like it's for us. And naturally, we're going to follow something which is for us and, and uh, a message which seems like it's, it's catered towards our understanding as well. The Qur'an, unlike the Bible, really is what it claims to be, which is a revelation for all of mankind. It primarily addresses the reader and speaks of the world not in terms of ethnic stocks, but the tendencies and behaviors of mankind. So, and this was the original intention, um, according to the Quran, this was the original intention of the Torah. This was the original intention of the message of Moses and the message of Jesus. It wasn't supposed to be racial. They were supposed to bear witness to the oneness of God to the whole world. But sadly, the children of Israel, they turned it into a racial cult, right? So um, when we read the Quran, it's not about uh, the sons of Aaron and you know, the, the sons of Levi and this and that. It, it speaks primarily in terms of behaviors and tendencies of people. The, these kinds of books, the Iliad, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Bible, the Old Testament, it's, it's, it's like the epic of the children of Israel. It's the Iliad of the children of Israel. Um, books with that kind of hist historical baggage um, you know, all these place names and people's names with, with no context, no explanation to them. Um, they never age well. They don't age well. But books that speak in terms of qualities that in some sense transcend history and time, human behavior, human archetypes, these age beautifully. And that's exactly how the Quran teaches, uh, what the, how the Quran speaks to us. It speaks to us in terms of people's behavior and the tendencies of people. And this has aged timelessly throughout the ages. The Qur'an's timeless message transcends space and time, not being confined to the small remit of one locality or period in history. It takes the Abrahamic faith in the purest form and opens it up to all peoples, which was the original intention. So, um, like I said, reading the, the Old Testament, it's almost like reading the Iliad. I'm reading the Iliad right now, and I have to constantly search up, like, who's this guy, who's that guy, because it doesn't explain, it doesn't give us any context. And I, I have to look into this stuff, because the Iliad is not suited to be a message for all of mankind. I have to somehow throw myself as best as I can into the culture of ancient Greek. It's, it's paradigm locked, whereas the Quran is not. Point number three, it confirms the previous scriptures. It absolutely, it does. While standing upon the same faith as the law and the prophets, so this faith of believing in, believing in one God and observing his commandments, the Qur'an also clears up the most confusing and enigmatic questions left over in the Bible, such as the nature of one, as, such as the nature of God, whether he is one or has other persons alongside him, the identity of Jesus, whether he is God in the flesh or just a prophet, what a man must do to attain salvation, faith or works, how atonement works, whether one can one man can die for another man's sins, or if each individual will be held accountable for their own transgressions, the rest of humanity outside of the children of Israel's responsibilities to God, and what is the nature of the hereafter. So these are very, very important questions which we we don't get a clear answer in the Bible. Okay. God says in the Quran that this book, the Quran, is a, a confirmation of the previous scriptures it acts as a control a furqan an authority over the previous scriptures and this is a hundred percent what i see at least in so far as that function which it claims to have for itself it a hundred percent completes that all of the most confusing questions big questions i have after reading the bible cover to cover which i have done um the quran clears those up while teaching a message which is not radically different to what i see in the law and prophets it's the same thing so, um, big questions like the nature of God. Is he one or does he have other persons alongside him? A son, whether the son is eternal, whether the son is begotten in history, his son who has existed and we owe uh, honoring of in a divine sense. Big question. 
you know, it's kind of confusing. You read the Old Testament. It, God is very clear. There is none like me. I share not my glory with another. Then we get into certain parts of the New Testament, like the Gospel of John, and then suddenly we have this Lord Jesus, and we have this guy who we need to honor alongside God. What am I supposed to do? Um, the identity of Jesus, whether he's God in the flesh or just a prophet. If you read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, you get the impression that Jesus is uh, even beneath John the uh, John the Apostle, or not John the Apostle, sorry, it's uh, John the Baptist. Um, he, he, he very clearly says that there is no good, don't call me good, there is only one good who is the Father, who is God, right? This is subordination. You have as well, uh, where, regarding the matter of John the Baptist, where he says, um, out of all people that are born of women, there is none um, as great as John the Baptist. Jesus was born of a woman, right? So you, you get that presentation of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels. Then you get into Gospel of John, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. He uses the I am statement of Elohim. You know, he who has seen the Father has seen me. Uh, you know, all, all these blasphemous statements that are attached to him, and the Quran clears that up. Anybody, read the New Testament from cover to cover, and you will be confused. Who is this Jesus guy? But the Quran clears that up, as it claims to do, as a correction, a confirmation of the previous scriptures. What a man must do to attain salvation. You read the, and this is, all this stuff is discussed in other parts of my book. I can't possibly go over them now. That would be like a five-hour video. But you can see them of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels very clearly, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He was teaching works-based salvation, works-based justification. The Old Testament, Moses, the, Jesus and the law and the prophets, their, their main concern was the law of God and upholding it as a means of justification and salvation. And, and same with James. He, he James is literally writing against Paul when he says faith without works is dead. Then you have Paul coming along saying a man is justified by faith without works and that Abraham is justified by his faith and not by his works, right? This is a big question. How am I supposed to be saved? Do I just believe or do I put confidence in my works? Do I not? The Bible gives us a contradictory testimony. And the Quran clears that up. It says those who believe in God do good deeds and believe in the last day. They have the reward and they need not fear nor regret. So that's another big question that the Bible has. God clears it up. The Quran, you can see it's performing its function as a control and confirmation of everything that was revealed before. How atonement works, whether one man can die for another's sins or if each individual will be held accountable for their own transgressions. It's confusing in the Bible. We have the story in the Old Testament. I think it's the book of Exodus where uh, the children of Israel are sinning and Moses is literally offering himself to God. He's saying, um, please God, write me, blot me out of your book of life and save my people. He's pleading and trying to intercede for his people. And God says, no, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And uh, the son shall not be put to death for the father. Neither the father shall be put to death for the son. And I find that quite interesting how pertinent those wordings are that wording is to christianity which literally says the son of god died for our sins um and you know, notice in that passage where moses says god please destroy me instead of the children of israel god doesn't say oh moses you're not perfect you've sinned before just wait till the perfect sacrifice comes jesus then you know this guy will die for all of mankind's sins he doesn't say that he says no man will die for another sin so this concept is denied of dying for another person's sins then of course when we get to the new testament gospel of john the gospels don't really talk so much about this it's mainly paul who emphasizes this uh, blood atonement this penal substitutionary atonement you have a completely different idea where not only has this man died for all of our sins, but that is the only means of salvation. We need to have faith in that alone. So that's another big question. How is man saved? Can I die for another's sins or am I held accountable for my own sins? The Quran clears that up and the Bible leaves you confused. What this goes, uh, the next point is uh, what I mentioned before, how uh, the, the Bible especially the Old Testament at least, it doesn't speak so much on the rest of mankind's responsibilities before the Lord. It, it leaves us out and it just talks about the children of Israel. What are the rest of us supposed to do? God is not just the God of Israel. He's the God of us too. He's the God of Pakistanis. He's the God of Nigerians. He's the God of Ethiopians. He's the God of everyone. Um, naturally, if he's our creator, we also have responsibilities towards him. He is our God. He you know, uh, is deserving of our worship. How do we fulfill our responsibilities before he who is our Lord as well? The Bible leaves large, uh, 
those details largely left out. And this is an interesting point I talk about in the book as well. You can see each religion, and the Islamic religion, the Christian religion, even the Judaic religion, they all in some ways accept that the Old Testament in and of itself is not enough because it leaves out the bulk of mankind. That's a big question. What about the rest of mankind? How are they supposed to serve their Lord? And each religion has its way of, in some sense, universalizing the doctrine, making it for all of mankind. But the, the most consistent version of that is undoubtedly the Islamic version. So the Jewish version, how do they universalize this doctrine, which is clearly racial? They make their Noahide laws and they say that, oh, during the Messianic age, the Messiah will come and... Everybody will follow the Torah and look to the children of Israel as the apple of God's eye. You know, um, and if you want to accept that kind of rabbinic interpretation, that's fine. But it it leaves you with the question. And, and the Noahide laws, there's there's no concept of this in, in the Old Testament. This is just made up by the rabbis. And if you want to accept this messianic age thing of universalizing the doctrine, I mean, okay, fine. The messianic age will all worship the God of Israel. But what are we supposed to do now? Messiah hasn't come according to your tradition. That doesn't work. Then you have the Christian religion. The Paul, he tried to universalize the doctrine as well. He's like, you know, salvation is not just for the, uh, the Jew, it's for the Greek, it's for the Gentile as well. But the problem with that is he profanes the religion. He makes it about worshiping the Son of God. It becomes polytheistic and idolatrous and believing in faith alone, believing that this man died for your sins. Um, he tries, in some sense, to universalize this doctrine that has been made racial by the children of Israel, but he just uh, he completely sullies its original intention and tradition. It's it's clearly contradictory to the law and the prophets. Then we finally have the Quran, which it takes that original tradition, worship one God, do good deeds, uphold His law, and it makes it easily accessible to all mankind. And it teaches us that it was originally intended for all of mankind from the beginning. It says that, you know, um, if you think that the gardens, the paradise is exclusive for you, it's saying this to the children of Israel, then wish for death if you be truthful. We know from the Quran that that was the original intention from the beginning. It was supposed to be a message for all of humanity. So in some sense, we all can see that this theology of the Old Testament is broken and incomplete. And all of us, Christian, Jew, and Muslim, were engaged in efforts to make this doctrine accessible to all peoples. And... The, the one who does this the most successfully is the Muslim, at least the Quran alone Muslim. Because, you know, the, the Messianic age, it's like, okay, what are we supposed to do now until the Messiah comes? We don't really have much of an answer. The Jews don't lie. They don't, or they, they, they don't try to hide the fact that their religion is racial. There's a reason why um, Christianity is the, the most popular religion in the world. Islam is you know, Hadithianism is the second most popular religion in the world. And you would expect that Judaism would be the third most popular, but no, it's not. It's like Hinduism or something like that. Hinduism has more followers. Sikhi has more followers. Judaism is like eighth or ninth on the list. And the reason is, why has Judaism not spread like Islam and Christianity? Because it's a racial religion. What would an Indian man from Kerala or, I don't know, uh, Himchal uh, Pradesh, what would he have to do with this religion that concerns a covenant with the people that has nothing to do with him? Do you know what I mean? That's why Judaism, it's never been a good religion for proselytizing. It's never spread that far. It's always been a preserve of the rabbis and the so-called Jewish people. Because, like I said, it leaves out a large portion of mankind in its theology. So, continuing with the reading, uh, where did I leave off? Yep, the Qur'an does exactly what it claims to. So the Qur'an, it clears up all the confusing questions of the previous scriptures in the most faithful way possible and accessible way possible. Point number four, why I believe the Qur'an is superior. The Qur'an is far more consistent with the message of the Old Testament and Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels than are Paul's writings. The message of the Old Testament is, in its essence, despite the racial tones to it, to worship the one true God and keep his holy commandments. And the message of Jesus in the Gospels is the exact same thing, at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke, along with additional information about preparing yourself for the kingdom of heaven through meritorious action. That's another thing I want to quickly mention. Let me back up a bit. Uh, another shortcoming within the Old Testament is that it hardly says anything about the afterlife. There's almost nothing. And that's a very important question. The New Testament fills this in a little more, but 
The Old Testament is like for thousands of years if we accept standard history. God barely said anything about the hereafter. And that's perhaps the most important aspect of a scripture to prepare us for our meeting with God. The, the Old Testament seems to be, again, largely concerned with this group called the children of Israel and their conditions with God in this covenant and how they are to remain in the land of Canaan. If they, you know, fulfill the covenant of God, then they're allowed to remain in the land of Canaan. If not, they'll be kicked out. But it hardly says anything about the hereafter. And the Quran definitely does not have that problem. It speaks about the hereafter pretty much on every single page and has it as its main function. That's its main focus. And any scripture that does not speak about the hereafter or uh, leaves many details left out is, it's incomplete. Um, continuing on, uh, the message of the Old Testament is in its essence to worship the one true God and keep his holy commandments. And the message of Jesus in the Gospels is the exact same thing, along with uh, additional information about preparing yourself for the kingdom of heaven through meritorious action. So what I'm trying to say is if you read, and I'm going to show you uh, where you can get that in my book. Mm. The real, you can go to page 719 where it's uh, the, the section titled The Real Basis for Christianity, Paul and Not Jesus. I will show you that Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he clearly teaches a works-based salvation. And Paul teaches a faith alone soteriology. So we have on the one hand, so works-based, excuse me, works-based salvation, we have Jesus the Law and the Prophets, the Old Testament, and the Qur'an, they all teach this. Then we have Paul on the other side teaching his faith alone without works. The Qur'an is more consistent with all the traditions that have come before, that single tradition, the Law and the Prophets. Paul teaches something different, and that's another reason why, why I had to reject the Bible in the New Testament. Um, pretty much half, if not over half, of the New Testament is written by Paul alone. It is Paul's testament, and if he's false, if he's a, really... This debate between Christianity and Islam, it boils down to who was the real prophet and who was the fake prophet. Was Muhammad the fake prophet or was Paul the fake prophet? If Paul was the fake, then Islam is true. And if Muhammad was a the fake, then Paul is true. And I show you how Paul patently contradicts everything in the Old Testament, everything that Jesus says in the Synoptic, Synoptic Gospels. And, you know, he's teaching a radically different religion. And if that's the case, and Paul wrote pretty much almost the entire New Testament, he's the most prolific author, that severely undermines the reliability of these Greek scriptures in general, if their main author is unreliable. But continuing on. This is precisely the emphasis of the Quran, to worship one Lord, uphold his statutes, do good deeds, and make yourself ready for eternity, i.e. the kingdom of heaven, Jesus' message. Minus certain historical differences, so, you know, whether Jesus was crucified or not, these historical matters, the overall philosophy of the Qur'an is the same as what the majority of the Bible teaches, 100%. Paul, on the other hand, espouses a radically different faith, which consists of repealing the law, not seeing good deeds as a means of justification, and having faith alone in Christ in order to be saved. Paul goes so far as to call the law a curse and maintain that to try and please God by upholding it is a useless endeavor. This contradicts the majority of what we read in the Bible and teachings of Jesus. In one camp, like I said, we have the prophets of old, Jesus and Muhammad, focusing on God and the commandments. And in another camp, we have all together, we have Paul focusing on Jesus and faith alone without works. Two completely different paradigms. Reason number five why I believe the Quran is superior to the Bible is this you can see i have it all listed in my book uh the quran does not contain the degeneracy which is found throughout the bible like the rape dismemberment cannibalism incest deception genocide sexual debauchery and blasphemy that within the biblical text is either spoken of in a neutral light or in many areas even endorsed by god himself it presents the prophets which are the chosen men of god in a far more appropriate light so if you read the bible there are no shortage of passages where you can just see this is obviously not from God. This is the hands of degenerate men that have wrote these things. The way it presents God in certain parts, the way it presents the prophets, which are supposed to be the most moral, noble, and pious men of God. I'll, I'll show you a list of it right now. You guys can check it out after. But just some things that I have here. You know, God commanding the children of Israel to cut off their foreskins as a sign of their covenant. The whole circumcision thing. 
David collects 200 of the Philistines' foreskins and presents them to Saul. The Bible has an obsession with foreskins, by the way. You don't find this in the Quran. God is reminded of his covenant by the bloody foreskin of Moses' son. So uh, Moses' wife, she cuts off the foreskin of her son, and the blood reminds God of their co his covenant with the children of Israel. God demands five golden hemorrhoids as his trespass offering. And if you don't know what hemorrhoids are, hemorrhoids is when you exert yourself too hard on the toilet or um you know other reasons that inf other reasons that you can have which inflame your anus and uh it starts to bleed and puff up and get red do you believe god would demand five golden hemorrhoids it's ridiculous uh passages that say kill every man woman and child but take the virgins for yourself you will never find anything like that in the quran and it's odd that Islam is associated with that kind of behavior. Christians will accuse Islam of that, mainly for the hadith, which you, you find this kind of stuff, but this whole thing of kill every man, woman, and child, plunder the village, destroy, kill even their cattle, the Bible says, and take the virgins for yourself, but kill all the women who are married. This is in the Bible. It's not in the Quran. It's just strange that the Islam has been associated with that. Um, there's a story of the concubine who gets raped to death, dismembered. Her body gets chopped up and sent to the 12 tribes of Israel, um, we know with the Eucharist, Jesus tells his followers to eat his flesh and drink his blood to be blessed. Uh, Moses sprinkling blood on his people as a sign of their covenant. There's this obsession with blood in the Bible. The children of Israel splash blood on their doors to avert the wrath of God. This has to do with the Passover, the, ch uh, the children of Israel and their uh, mores in the land of Egypt. Noah gets drunk and sees his son's nakedness, so he curses him and his children, which, I mean... It's just a, a silly story because um, if Noah was such a degenerate to the point where he drank so much, he fell asleep naked and his son walked in on his tent and saw his nakedness. That's not Noah's fault. Or that's not the son's fault. That's Noah's fault. Why is Ham getting cursed for this and all of his generation? Lot gets drunk and sleeps with his daughters. Abraham pretends his wife is his sister so a stranger can sleep with her. And you actually see in that story where... Uh, the, the king who's about to sleep with Abraham's wife, he doesn't because the Lord appears to him and tells him, you have another man's wife. So Abraham lies. He says that this is not my wife, this is my sister to save his own life. And the guy, um, the king, I think his name is Abimelech. Abimelech, he takes in uh, Abraham's wife. And just before he's about to consummate the marriage, God reveals to him that this is another man's wife. And God says to him, basically, don't do this. I'm going to curse you and your land. And it's like, it's it's so unfair. Uh and, and he, like the only person who behaves honorably in that story is the king himself. And he, he says, as soon as he finds out that this is Abraham's wife, he's like, he didn't tell me that. I didn't know. Okay, let me let her go. I want nothing to do with her. And he, he leaves them on their way. When really the person in that story that should have been punished was Abraham and his wife for lying. We have Abraham and his, his wife basically willing to be a whore, to lie and sleep with another man just to save Abraham's life. This is the kind of light, or I should say darkness, in which many parts of the Bible present the most honorable men of God. You have weird stuff like uh, Elisha uh, curses children. Who, so these children, they make fun of his bald heads, and he curses them, and bears come out and devour them into pieces. Uh, we have the, the, the classical debacle of Jacob, who steals Esau's blessings through a, a long chain of deceptions, which his mother helps him in, and you know, he even lies on the name of God in that story as well. God rests, which we know in the Quran, you know, in the Bible it says that uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and he rested on the seventh day. In the Bible it says God created the heavens and the earth, and weariness took him not. So God specifically in the Quran refutes the idea of his resting and getting tired. This one is perhaps the most blasphemous of them all. You can find this on page 779. Moses corrects God, calls him evil, and God repents. So God is about to destroy the children of Israel on account of their idolatry in that story. And uh, Moses basically says to God, well, you know, if you're going to destroy them, then the, the false gods of the other nation, they're going to seem superior to you because your people have been destroyed and they're going to laugh at Israel and the God of Israel. And literally, God forbid, Moses says to the Lord, turn from this evil and repent and God repents. Oh my gosh. It, do you believe that's real? I mean, you have to accept it if you believe the Bible is 100% word of God. You know, it, it also makes God out to be 
like this man who repents and makes mistakes and regrets his decisions. You know, you have God who regrets making humanity and he repents. That was during the time of Noah's flood. Uh, you have this part where it says that God can't compete with chariots of iron. God couldn't send out a certain people from this area because they had chariots of iron. God can't compete with chariots of iron, the same God who levels entire cities with fire and brimstone. And then you have all kinds of biblical pornography, just extremely – I'm not even going to read this stuff in front of you, but um, extremely sexually explicit passages. You have the the, the Song of Solomon, which is it's, – it's, there's no moral component to that book whatsoever. It's, it's literally all about uh, the sexual sprees this woman has with her husband, presumably Solomon, and how much she enjoys his body, describing a strong chest and his legs like pillars. Like, why am I reading this? Is this the word of God? Does, does God want me to have those images in my mind when reading sacred scripture, just uh, the, the sexual escapades of this woman with her husband, which – Obviously, should be kept indoors in private, in the private chambers. You even have one where uh, they, they describe the, the the story of Ahola and Aholaiba, the harlots. Um, it, it describes the people who she slept with. They have hor uh, phalluses like horses. There's all kinds of filth throughout the Bible. And just the fact that the Quran has nothing like that, nothing like that, convinces me that it is superior to the Bible in every respect. Number six is the Quran emphasizes hell so often and in the most graphic manner possible, something which is largely missing from the Bible. From the Quran, we get a very clear understanding that hell is the most excruciating pain one could ever experience and that whoever enters within its precincts, precincts excuse me, stays therein for eternity. That motif is emphasized on practically every page in the beginning to the end, from the beginning to the end. So... The reason here, why, another reason why I accept the Qur'an is its emphasis on hell. This is an argument I put forward even to people who believe in reincarnation. Uh, do you believe that if a scripture is from God, that it would give us the best reason to be righteous, right? Yeah, naturally, God would give us the best reason to live a moral and godly life. Okay, uh, what better reason is there than having the constant threat of not temporary but eternal damnation torment and hell constantly being reminded to you the quran pretty much reminds you of hell on pretty much practically every single page um that's a really good reason to remain righteous and the fact that the quran emphasizes that over and over it leads me to believe it's a scripture from god um it, it raises the stakes higher than anything else i have ever read and it truly puts the fear of the lord within me where i do not want to transgress his law and i want to remain as faithful as possible because i don't want to burn in hell for all eternity which is a motif emphasized throughout the quran we don't find this in the bible this kind of strong emphasis on hell and it obviously it tells you in many parts to do good deeds, to do good deeds, but it doesn't give you the best reason for it. And that's why I believe in the Quran. It gives us the best reason. Um, where did I leave off? Right here. Um, having the threat of eternal hell constantly reminded to us in the plain understanding that it is our works which will either save us from it or land us in there. All of this gives a person the best reason to remain righteous in their life. What better motivator can there be other than not temporary but the threat of eternal fiery torment that would encourage you to live a moral and godly life by helping those around you and not be a parasite on humanity? Neither the Bible nor any other religious text in the world emphasizes hell or raises the stakes as high as does the Quran. If any book must be from God, it is the Quran, which by the nature of its dire message spurs man on to live the highest quality life possible. I would expect nothing less from a, a revelation from my creator. So, and yeah, hell is talked about in many other traditions around the world, but the, the eternal nature of it, the excruciating nature of it, and the emphasis on it is found nowhere else other than in the Quran. Point number seven. Um, it's in the Quran. It's the narrative style is unlike any other. The Quran is written, this is another selling point, the Qur'an is written in a way where it feels as if the Creator is speaking directly to you. So you'll see God will say over and over, Say thou, say thou, say thou. And I hate 
how the Sunni translators they'll put say thou and O oh Muhammad in brackets. It doesn't say Kul O oh Muhammad. It just says say thou. Um, yes, this is being said to Muhammad, but it's for us as well. Muhammad is not that different from us. The very arguments that God is giving him, we are to use those in our day to day life as well. So the Quran has that style of speaking. It's as if God is directly commanding you. Yeah, the Quran is written in a way where it feels as if the Creator is speaking directly to you. I have never read any book like this, and the authority that such a personal, evocative format of communication carries is unparalleled. For this reason, the totally unique, inimitable way in which the Quran addresses the reader, God challenges the deniers and scoffers to attempt to produce a writing similar to it, which of course they never will. So we read in the name of God, the Almighty and the Merciful in the Quran, uh, chapter 17, verse 88. Say thou, if men and jinn gathered to produce the like of this Qur'an, they would not produce the like thereof, though they were helpers of one another. So God says we're never going to be able to produce anything like this Qur'an. And that's what I see, that this style of communication, it's so authoritative. What you get with the Bible, again, because it has this structure of God speaking with the children of Israel, you get this feeling like you're almost peeping at God and his commandments and expectations through a peephole. You know, you're like looking through a door and you're seeing God deal with and chide his people. It's not very personal. It's not about you. The Quran doesn't have that. I'm not peeping at God and his commandments through a peephole, but rather it's as if God is directly commanding me to say this and do that and do this and do that. This is just a far more authoritative way of speaking. And this goes in, in line with what I said before about how the Qur'an is far more accessible than the Bible. Over and over we find the construction throughout the Qur'an of God telling us to say thou, followed by a potent argument, statement of fact, response, or question that we are to use in our debates and conversation. Whereas reading the Bible in most parts gives the feeling as if we are watching God as a third person stranger while he deals with his people called the children of Israel with little directed towards us, almost like the reader is peeping through a hole in the door watching events that do not concern himself. The Quran, on the other hand, gives us the impression of God personally and directly dealing with the reader himself with various commands. The Quran's literary style brings you closer to God and his expectations of you. So that's another selling point. And um, I'm not going to read this entire thing. It's quite a long... Actually, should I? Yeah, I'm not going to read it right now. But my last argument, it's uh, uh, a little more involved. And it's the fact that the Quran swears over and over of its divinity and its truth. It takes the most tremendous oaths on the fact of its divinity. So we hear God says, you know, um, by the wise Quran, then by the Lord. He's... It's swearing by the Lord of the heaven and the earth. It is as true that you are speaking by the mount. And uh, so remind thou, and by the favor of thy Lord, thou art neither a soothsayer nor possessed. By the star when it descends, then I swear by the setting of the stars, it is a tremendous oath if you but knew. It is a noble recitation and hidden writ. So we see in the Quran the construction of God swearing upon the heavens, upon the earth, upon himself, upon the most sacred and noble things in our world. On, um, he's, he's swearing on them for the veracity and accuracy and uh, truthfulness of the Quranic message. And my point is this. <clears throat> so at the let, let's say the Quran is not the word of God. Let's put that aside. At the very least, and I, I tell you, anybody who has not read it, just read the book for yourself and see what it says. But for me, what I have concluded is that at the very least, whether it's the word of God or not, the Quran is a noble book. Okay, it has a very powerful message. It tells us only good things, goodness, righteousness. Anybody who lives their life by the dictates of that book will be successful. It is a noble book. It is a pure book. It has a, a, a profound message that is not sullied or tainted. And if that be the case, if I've proven, I've shown that the Quran is not what the Hadithans make it to be, not what the Christians say it is, this book of barbarism. It is a book of justice, moral uprightness. Let me actually read you uh, a little portion of this paragraph, or uh, the section of my book. There is no way for you to truly understand this fact unless you read the Quran for yourself, but believe me when I say, as someone who has spent a lot of time with the text, that the main emphasis of the book is simply to remember God as often as possible, do as many good deeds as you can, and prepare yourself for the Day of Judgment. That is pretty much all the Quran focuses on in a nutshell. 
It calls us to uphold God's commandments, to think of him day and night, to remember our final accountability, to be kind to our parents, to give charity to those in need, to uphold our contracts faithfully, to have mercy on mankind, to not murder innocents, to not take interest from others, to refrain from intoxicants and gambling, to be stewards and witnesses to justice, even if it be against ourselves and our families, to uphold fairness even with our bitterest of enemies, to establish right ordering so far as we are able to whenever corruption is being spread, to call others to God, to fight only when oppressed, and to fear no one except our Creator. So that is a summary of the Quranic message. It has a noble, pure doctrine. Now, um, would it not be reasonable when such, at the very least, it's a noble book, whether it's the Word of God or not, when such a noble and righteous and honorable book swears to us over and over by the stars, by the sun, by the moon, by the setting of the stars, by the creator of the heavens and the earth, that it's true. W would it not be reasonable for us to take it seriously? So the example I give in, in this writing is uh, think about if you had a noble and upright, a virtuous friend who, let's say you guys were going to school together, you guys were in college, and he said he overheard your teacher in a conference with other teachers saying that he plans a pop surprise quiz for the class, which is going to be worth 20% of your final grade. Uh, if he was a noble and trustworthy person, you would, and he swore to you, he said, I swear to you, man, I, I heard them saying that they're going to do this. Um, you would take that seriously, would you not? Because he's a noble and trustworthy friend. You um, would probably start studying that very same night and preparing for what you think is going to be a pop quiz in the future. Does it not? It wouldn't be. It would not be reasonable for you to not take your friend seriously, who's trustworthy. Um, at the same reason, why? That, that for that same reason, it wouldn't be sensible to not take the Quran seriously. It is a righteous book. It is a noble book. It swears over and over that it's the word of God and makes the most tremendous oaths. And just the fact that it is such a noble message, it means we should take these swearings and these oaths seriously. That doesn't even make any sense. This is what I talk about here. How. How could a book which is so noble and so righteous at the same time curse itself so bad? If, let's say, Muhammad invented it or somebody invented it, it's not the word of God, it's made up. Um, the amount of curses that would be upon this book are unimaginable. Uh, it swears on God, it swears on the heavens, it swears on the earth. Does that not seem like a contradiction? A book which is, again, you can only know this by reading it. Read it for yourself. But a book which is so pious and so fair and good in its message, at the same time would be so cursed and messed up and so damned by taking all of these false oaths upon itself? That doesn't make any sense. How could a book which is so good be so cursed at the same time? No, the fact that this amazing book called the Qur'an swears over and over, um, we should take that seriously, and I... I trust its claim on that matter. When it says, by the stars, by the heavens, by the earth, by the creator of the heavens and the earth, I take it seriously on that. I have no reason not to when I have seen the quality of its message, so I'm going to trust its testimony. And that's essentially a summary of the reasons why I believe the Quran is superior to the Bible. I pray and I hope you guys found it beneficial and that, you know, you guys will even open my book and read these for yourselves, maybe print it off, write down the arguments, do what you need to do, have them on you, and you can just clearly articulate and explain why the scripture we hold to is better than the Bible whenever you deal with these Christians who have all of these unjust accusations against, against the Quran, so many unfair things which sadly the Hadith has given them the ammo on. They've given them all of these points that they use against the Quran, but um, if you just consider the Quran in and of itself, you read both of them, you are going to see which one has a superior quality and I pray that you can use these arguments in conversations with Christians and Jews and other people. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's really all I got to say on the matter. I hope this talk was a blessing. And yeah, peace to you. Remember, the seed abounds, so keep your eyes wide open. Peace out. Peace and blessings in the name of the Most High, viewer. My name is Walid Naim, and I am a zealous submitter to the one true God, the creator of all mankind. Do you notice something wrong with the world? something strange. Despite us having a church, synagogue, and mosque in every neighborhood, how has this entire Western civilization fallen into abject atheism, nihilism, and savagery? Why does life just seem so dull, so meaningless, and so devoid of anything real in the Occidental world? 
Despite the ubiquitous presence of these religious institutions, why are our so-called Muslim sons in large numbers drinking, smoking, partying, and chasing after women with no seeming desire to do anything more with their life other than satisfy their base pleasures when God has commanded them to be clean, righteous, and responsible leaders of their community? And why are our hijabi so-called Muslim daughters walking around with tight jeans that reveal their figure with TikTok accounts posting semi-provocative, self-absorbed videos of themselves online for the world to see when God has commanded them to lengthen their garments and be modest in their mannerisms? What has happened here? These young men and women are supposed to be making themselves right before God while raising the next generation of ardent defenders of the holy faith. But it seems that Islam features no more in their lives other than a scarf on their head, a Friday fidgeting around in the mosque when their parents forced them to go against their will, or a decorative hanger in their car. At this rate, if God allows us to continue going down the road it is, then Islam and the Quran will become pretty much non-existent in the lives of most of our descendants, if it wasn't already non-existent now. If we do not take a stand soon... In a few generations, our children's children will likely be indistinguishable from the secular West. Is that the kind of world we want to live in? Our kids to live in? A world practically devoid of the remembrance of the one God and all things sane? I obviously can't speak for you, but for my own self, I can personally say, count me out of it. I'm not going to sit here and just watch my brothers and sisters, those who claim to believe in God alone, believe in Judgment Day, His prophets and angels, and all the other aspects of this holy creed get duped into going to hell. I'm not going to let this happen without at least something of an effort on my end to reroute this dark trajectory. So, again, how in the world do we end up here? There is a mosque in practically every neighborhood in the West, and no shortage of donations that get dropped in their boxes. They have had lots of funding, lots of time, and unquestioning support from their respective congregations, yet somehow have been run over by the secular atheist. All of their so-called Muslim children go to the atheist, secular public schools for most of their week to be taught beliefs that are completely incompatible with the Qur'an. And we wonder why they have ended up the way they are. If these houses, and by these houses I mean the mosques, were truly of God that were doing everything right, then why would our Lord let them get so decisively trampled upon by their enemies? Why do the wicked have all of the reins of power here? Clearly, something is not adding up. Well, it is my thesis here today that the vast, vast majority of mosques that exist in this world today have lost their way and follow a religion which is completely foreign to the Qur'an. This is why they have failed so miserably in the West, and it seems that God has forgotten them. In truth, the real reason behind their shortcoming is that they, and many of us, have forgotten God himself, which is why he has left us here collecting our bitter receipts. So, what are my exact criticisms of the mosques today? As a Muslim, and a man committed to the truth above all else, what are my personal gripes with their institution, which claims to be for God? The first glaring problem I can think of is that the majority of people who call themselves Muslim have allied themselves with a body of literature that is foreign to the Word of God, treating it equal to and in fact above the Qur'an itself. Of course, I am talking about the Hadith. Listen, the facts are this. There is no justification within the Qur'an which tells us to follow this Hadith stuff, which came hundreds of years after the Prophet Muhammad died, and therefore he could have had no ability to oversee what people have said about him and determine if it is true or false. It is now becoming crystal clear, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, that many, many things that have been ascribed to him in their most quote-unquote authoritative texts, which they call their Sahih Hadiths, are forgeries that directly contradict God's final revelation. To take these words of men, i.e. the Hadith, and hold them to be equally authoritative to the words of God would be breaking the first and most important commandment, which is to worship God alone, making no equals with him. To say that these supposed words of Muhammad, which are not even Muhammad's own words, but simply very doubtful rumors about what people who existed hundreds of years after him say he said, that have been decided upon by the scholars as authoritative holds equal or in fact any way in our faith comparable to the verbatim words of God himself, the Holy Quran, is idolatry. You are exalting man's words to the status of divinity, which should only be given to God's words. Nothing comes even close to the Quran because God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is its author. 
This includes the Hadith too, which pales in comparison and is superfluous to the glorious Qur'an. If you are interested in seeing a full refutation of the Hadith, you may watch my video titled, A Defense of Prophet Muhammad, David Wood and Hadith Exposed, which is linked below. In it, along with refuting and putting in his place the worst opponent of Islam on the internet, Mr. David Wood, I also expose how the Hadith is completely contradictory to the Qur'an and the source of much of the Muslim world's problems. It is a two-hour long documentary where I seek to demonstrate the true character of Muhammad in the Qur'an, defending his history and personality with primary source quotations. I clear the last prophet of God's name from the people who have tarnished his reputation the most, which are certain types of Christians, and, sad to say, hadith-following Muslims, which have said many terrible things about him. No, Muhammad was not a money-hungry, tyrannical warlord who married a six-year-old girl. He was a shy, humble, meek man who married adult women, had compassion for even his worst enemies, and oftentimes had a tough time even standing up for himself out of fear of hurting other people's feelings. This is all demonstrated in detail in my video. Once again, the link for that will be in the description under the tab, The True Character of Muhammad in the Qur'an. So that is the first problem with the mosques, the reason for which I feel they have been forsaken by God, their adoption of an apostate literature which contradicts their foundational scripture. The second point of contention I have with many of the mosques is their seeming unwillingness to say anything controversial which may make them face persecution from their government. The fact that 9-11 was not only an inside job, but the fact that no planes hit the Twin Towers on that day, and the whole charade was a hoax designed by the governments of the world to forever frame the Muslim people as terrorists and justify invasions in our countries, should be taught to every man, woman, and child. This great fraud of the September attacks has left such a lasting, enduring reputation on every brown person, and Muslim in general, that it should be discussed in every mosque. Our people are not responsible for that crime, but it was the governments of the world who carried out that plot and framed us for it. 9-11 is just only one small example, though. There are many, many other quote-unquote conspiracy theories, which are really just conspiracy facts, avoided by the mosques due to their controversy, like the fact that the monetary system in the West is an ungodly scam based on usury, the fact that the so-called healthcare system is a predatory empire which doesn't try to cure anybody but instead makes money off of human suffering, the fact that sodomite propaganda is being promoted to the masses, including our children, and the fact that the thing which I will call the C-1-9-er, to avoid censorship, was a hoax perpetrated by the powers that be to greatly expand their police state, censorship incentives, and surveillance systems worldwide in order to create their new world order, and much more. These governments that have occupied our lands are de facto terrorist regimes, and the mosques seem to say nothing of it. They appear to be more concerned with not being labeled extremists while they live their comfortable, well-funded lives, avoiding topics that are hard to deal with due to the abject persecution they bring. That is my second problem with them. They're at the very least lack of awareness, or if not, perhaps lack of willingness to address the real geopolitical situation going on in the world. And lastly, my third trouble with the mainstream mosques, which can also be put into the category of conspiracy facts, is their complete ignorance on the true nature of the earth. It may sound as a shock to you, my viewer, that the Qur'an, the Bible, and in fact all of the ancient scriptures teach the earth is flat and stationary. This is the only model of the world which is compatible with those texts, and also scientifically provable. This flat earth conspiracy, which should really be called the globe earth conspiracy, is one of the biggest lies of the modern world we are told, and goes in line with what I said earlier about the endemic corruption of the governments of the world. Everything you have been told about where you live is a fabrication, and the space agencies are a shameless hoax. For a fully detailed presentation on the subject of flat earth, where I demonstrate the science, the history, the philosophy, the verses in the Bible and Quran proving it, and much more, you can read my book titled The Flat Earth Manifesto, which is linked in the description. This work runs to nearly 1,200 pages and is practically a textbook on not only the topic of flat earth, but the subject of physics proper, and I expose the biggest fraudulent religion of the West, which is science worship, otherwise known as scientism. As with all of my work, it too is available for free. No, you do not live on a pathetic speck of dust spinning around in the middle of nowhere in space. 
You live in a brilliant, intelligently designed terrarium created by God and are at the center of the universe. Again, to learn more, the link to the Flat Earth Manifesto will be in the description. Those right there are my three biggest scores against the mosques of today. There are more points I could bring up, but these are the major ones. These are the controversies which have estranged me from the rest of the so-called Muslim world. Believe me when I say that I would love to join them and that it hurts me so deeply that I have to pit myself up against the very institution I was born and raised in, the mosques I attended from childhood whose carpets upon which I walked, stood, prayed, and listened to the preaching in my earliest years. But that is the price to pay for the truth. My commitment to God and what is right is more important than my emotional attachments to a place that was once dear to my heart. Simply put, this is why I think God has forsaken us. This is why I think that the mosques have been steamrolled by the secular atheist. It is because most of us have abandoned the word of God, neglected preaching the truth, and instead chosen comfort over courageous action. That is my thesis to why this great falling away in the West has taken place. If this sounds shocking to you, if it sounds so unbelievable that the majority of the so-called Muslim world could be deceived so badly, then I simply have these verses in the Quran to show you. In the name of God, the Almighty and the Merciful. Chapter 6, verse 116. And if thou obey most of those upon the earth, they will lead thee astray from the path of God. They follow only assumption, and they are only guessing. Chapter 25, verse 30. And the messenger will say, O oh my Lord, my people took this Quran as a thing abandoned. God has really predicted this a millennia ago. He knew that the people who follow what is really right are few and far between, that the majority of men and women are led astray, and the people who claim to love Muhammad the most, i.e. mainstream Muslims, would abandon the glorious Quran. God has revealed to us a thousand years ago that this all would be the case. It is my mission, therefore, by the will of God, to band together with like-minded believers who have understood the truth and work together to build a new institution from the ground up, founded upon prudent fear. We need to start fresh, start anew. We need to build a new mosque where people can hear the unfiltered preaching from the Quran alone, where men and women can get married, where children can play and be educated in the truth, and where the name of the Most High God, without any associate partners, can be remembered. We need a group of highly dedicated men who will raise and defend this institution with their own hands if need be and go out into the world warning people of the punishment of God, bearing witness to the truth of his oneness. That is my mission, my viewer. If you found that this mission of mine has touched your heart and is something you want to get involved with, then feel free to contact me in the email below. I am located in Ontario, Canada, and I'm looking forward to form a community with like-minded believers who want to contribute to this great cause. I am neither a nationalist nor racially biased. If you follow the Quran alone and believe in the truth, then as far as I'm concerned, you are my brother in the faith. I prefer you over someone of my own kindred who denies God and commits corruption in the earth. My loyalties are primarily ideological, not racial. Remember, my viewer, that this life is short. Everything we do and don't do is recorded by God and will either bear witness for us or against us on the day of judgment. Hell is eternal, and I do not know about you, but as for me, I want to meet my creator in the best state possible. I want to spend my life struggling to build up my people, the true Muslims, so that God may be pleased with me on that day. If you are interested in that, then feel free to join me. If not, then find something else good to do which will prepare you for your appointment with the Most High. That is where we are all going anyway. With that being said, I say peace and God bless to all of you good people. Take care, everyone.